Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about whether a story about radical politics can be authentic to activists and also accessible to people who aren't activists. Um, I think the answer is a resounding yes. Um, but in thinking about it, um, one of the things that I think is important to acknowledge is that making fiction accessible is not the same as convincing uh, or converting a reader to a character's or an author's point of view. And I think part of what makes uh, fiction seem real rather than staged, of course it is staged, um, but what makes it seem real is the tug of war between readers and the material. I think that um, those this isn't me moments when uh, a reader engages in a, a mental and emotional relationship with what's happening on the page that's different from identification um, with characters and ideas. Uh, uh, it can be an uncomfortable relationship. Um, and so it can feel a lot like the way we relate sometimes to people in real life. Um, an encounter between distinct and sometimes even opposed hearts and minds. Um, engaging in a situation or a line of thought that, uh, that a reader first bridles against, I think can enlarge her or his zones of empathy, um, zones of understanding. And, and I would argue that that's, uh, that's how fiction best serves readers and authors alike. So I'm going to read a passage from my um, uh, newly released novel, Consequence, uh, in which I hope this kind of tug of war takes place in a reader's mind. Um, I do intend it to. Um, but let me give a little context about, about where I'm going to be reading from. So uh, the core of Consequence is about an activist collective uh, here in San Francisco. They call themselves the Triangle, after the DuBose Triangle neighborhood where they live. Um, they're helping to plan a protest against a biotech convention that's coming to the Moscone Center. And there's a few things going on. There's a street protest uh, that's being planned publicly by, um, by uh, a sprawling coalition of affinity groups. And uh, in addition, the collective is helping to plan a, a clandestine shutdown of the Bay Bridge. In a subplot that's parallel to the San Francisco organizing, a cell of saboteurs uh, spearheaded by a shadowy character whose nom de guerre is Chagall, is planning to destroy a GMO research facility uh, outside Lincoln, Nebraska. What connects these two threads is the protagonist. His name is Chris Coleman. Uh, he's a member of the San Francisco Collective, and he's been anonymously recruited into the sabotage plot uh, in order to write a political justification for, uh, for this action, which has actually only been described to him in fairly general outline. So I'm going to read from one of Chagall's chapters, um, fairly late in the, in the novel. Um, Chagall is on the penultimate leg of his mission. Uh, he's driving an empty truck across the long uh, northern edge of Nebraska. I see a map of the long nor northern edge of Nebraska in the back of the room. That's convenient. Um, Chagall is on the cusp of attempting to drive a truck bomb into a building. Um, and uh, it's an empty building, it's under construction. Uh, but the question, um, and the reason I selected this passage, is whether a form of radicalism that many people would consider quite extreme, uh, even though it's targeting property and not people, whether that can be credible to activists, uh, perhaps even sympathetic to some, uh, and whether it can be not immediately categorizable and dismissible as terrorism. Uh, by readers who are more distant from political uh, engagement. So, uh, let me read from chapter 31. Past Valentine, the light falls away. Twilight, dusk, then the full-on rural night of north-central Nebraska. Chagall passes a huddle of low-slung buildings. Johnstown, population 53. He keeps to the speed limit. A high-pitched whine coming from someplace deep in the tranny doesn't concern him. Only a few hundred miles to go. He sits upright in the waffled vinyl seat, eyes prickly, willing himself to stay focused. Seven hours sleep in Rapid City didn't even the books on the all-nighter outside Lincoln. National Public Radio is playing through the truck's cheap speakers. 
pulled down into the Niobrara watershed with a satellite receiver. A captain from the Office of Naval Research is describing Silver Fox, a surveillance drone that weighs in at 20-some pounds and can be launched from a catapult. Chagall is intrigued. Several years ago, he outfitted a pair of Hobby Zone supercuts with digital cameras and souped-up powertrains. The buyer was a sadistic-looking skinhead, fresh out of Supermax Solitaire. Chagall never asks, but he figures whatever the skinhead was looking for wound up destroyed or stolen and would have, with or without, a model airplane's assist. Vast fields of monocrop lay quilted across the nightscape. Here there's nothing to survey. He drives past corn sown for miles on end, then alfalfa for miles and miles more, field edges still in his headlights. Grassland lit by the waxing moon between Ainsworth and Long Pine, roads straight as a plumb line. Money dipped out of ill-gotten gain, like the wad he was paid by the Brotherhood skinhead, is what funds Chagall's work. Robbery, extortion, predation on weakness. These are fuel at perilously thin remove to his exploits. He harvests from evildoers to prevent another evil's fruition. In some ways, he is distant kin to the Navy captain on NPR, Chagall supposes, as the radio report wraps. The naval officer is funded by compulsory taxes. Chagall shakes down the nation's sad underbelly to finance his own arsenal. They are equally convinced of their own ultimate goodness. Neither employs pure methods to influence the course of history. At their best, he and the captain each aim toward principled ends. Their ends differ, of course. But a greater gulf is the chain of command behind which a military man can take cover. Chagall bears full responsibility for his choices. Rock County passes under wheel without a stop. Well into Holt, there's a stretch of circular pivot irrigated fields, like God's own change purse emptied out, great earth coins laid edge to edge in moonlight. Then the dark houses and shuttered businesses of O'Neill. The Elkhorn River glints from time to time between shadowy stands of cottonwood and willow. Mm. So there are a couple tug of war aspects to this passage, um, imagining that you caught them, uh, ones in which a reader might not buy into Chagall's point of view. The saboteur justifies to himself a business model, if you will, that's predicated on getting paid to enable nasty criminal activity. That's not pretty. Um, and Chagall compares himself to a military officer. So to a reader who is not critical of the U.S. military, uh, that comparison might easily be seen as facile or self-aggrandizing or even delusional. Um, to a reader who is critical of the U.S. military and militarism, a comparison of a radical echo saboteur to uh, a captain in the U.S. Navy might be equally unsettling, if uh, perhaps in a different way. So does this kind of engagement, this kind of mental, emotional, and political tug of war between the reader and the material uh, on the page result in fiction that's sympathetic to radicals? Is it credible to progressives? How do less political readers respond to it? Um, I'm quite sure that uh, I'm not the best judge of my own work. Um, I hope you'll have a read and form your own opinion. Thanks. Thank you.